So hello and welcome. This series of workshops is made possible by a researcher-led initiative funded by the University of Exeter's Research and Development Culture Team. So, so thank you. Um, so this, this workshop was developed to bring together early, early career researchers and um, students across disciplines who believe distance-based options are essential for inclusivity in higher and further education. So from this initiative, we, we hope to create a network of peers with a shared interest in teaching or developing distance-based courses um, and also exploring best practices for accommodating remote students, mentees and colleagues. Um, so part of the goal is to, to raise awareness of how distance-based options are essential for inclusive, inclusivity um, and also to learn how to implement best practices. So we, we hope to achieve this via this, this interactive workshop series, which this is the first of the free, free workshops, and by building a community for continued um, collaboration or peer, su peer support or advice. Um, so we, myself, Ben and Sarah, we, we all have experience of and have benefited from distance-based education and working practices. Um, so this project is more about learning together and learning from each other rather than us free imparting any special any special knowledge. So so yeah, our guest speakers over the, the free sessions have taught and developed vocational courses, established distance based university courses, mentored distance based students from a variety of backgrounds and disciplines. Um, and we hope to learn from them, but we also want to open up the space for you to share your own experiences and challenges. Um, and we'll, we'll put the, the link to the, um, to the boards who can introduce yourselves here in a moment. Um, so yeah, each, each workshop will conclude with a round table discussion and this is intended to stimulate ongoing discourse. Um, and these are not recorded, as I said, and we encourage you to join the, the discussion, share your own stories, um, either in these forums or via the interactive boards. Um, so, so one thing, so one thing I have encountered is pushback when I promote or advocate for distance-based options, um, and I do get it. So I do appreciate that for many people, the in-person experience is invaluable, especially, for example, young people wanting to live away from home for the first time, um, and even for fully funded PhD students who do not have health challenges, care and duties, or family commitments that make relocation unfeasible. I wouldn't want to deny that experience, um, deny them that special experience of full emergence in scholarly life. Um, however, with a bit of effort, the, the traditional student and um, research experience could exist alongside remote options. Um, and also for teachers too, it's not always um, ideal to have to, to be on campus. Um, um, and so, so this sort of hybrid, or, or having this other option, it would make it possible for non-traditional students who for whatever reason cannot relocate to attend a class or a course to also engage and contribute to, to academia. I, I probably should have introduced myself at the beginning, right? So I, I'm Chris and I'm um, um, co-organizing this, this initiative with, with Sarah and Ben. Um, so I completed an MA in Amphizoology from Exeter while working full time. Um, and while the course itself was not cheap, the fact that I could keep working made it possible um, because the expense of relocating, the risk of not being able to find full-time work would have made um, doing an in-person course impossible, um, especially where I was um, located. And I'm currently doing a distance-based um, PhD through, through Exeter. Um, so with that, I'm gonna just pass you on to Ben to quickly say hi and, and then Sarah. Hello there, I'm Ben and uh, I've been in distance learning now for about, uh, this is the fourth year, I did a two year MA education online uh, distance learning at Exeter because um, it was the best one that I could find and it had, had been, I've been teaching, I've been teaching for a long time and left teaching due to ill health, uh, but carry, wanted to eventually to carry on studying and so it was when I saw the online MA with Exeter that I decided to take the plunge. I have um, completed that, completed that two years, uh, completed those two years and decided that I wanted to stay in academia and actually go a bit further. I do have a specialist mentor who on June the 6th will be joining this 
uh, workshop uh, to, to talk about his role and his role in helping me to move forward and to stay focused and to keep uh, within the parameters of distance learning. And I'm now um, second year PhD online distance learning at Exeter as well. So um, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I'll pass on to Sarah. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Chris, for the introduction to the series of workshops. I'm one of those lucky people who has been fortunate enough to take advantage of distance learning for my BSc, two MAs, and now I'm pursuing my PhD. In order to not take up too much time now, I'll write, uh, I've written more about my experiences and the reasons I chose distance learning on the Padlet. Chris will put the link in the chat now. As Chris just mentioned in the introduction, please feel free to introduce yourself on the Padlet along with your distance learning experiences and hopes. Just an admin note, we are here in person, but um, we've recorded uh, parts of our chat in case we lose the internet. So please feel free to ask any questions in the chat as the talks are presented. Also, please don't forget to mute your mics and turn off your videos during the presentations to save bandwidth. We will be recording the session, but we won't be sharing a recording of the question and answer portion, so please don't be afraid to speak up. The timetable for today, Chris will now post also in the chat. Okay, so let me introduce you to our two speakers today, who have, been, who have put a lot of effort into both creating and successfully running their own online teaching and mentoring businesses. These courses are bringing teachings to those who wouldn't otherwise be able to access the knowledge they offer to impart. Our second speaker is Emma McLean of Hound Charming, a force-free training and behavior consultancy company with a focus on dogs. But first we'll be listening to Dr. Teresa Tyler, director of The Dog Genius and former distance-based postgraduate researcher at Exeter University. Te Teresa will be speaking about developing professional courses that meet industry standards outside of academia. Teresa's talk is about 20 minutes long, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for questions. Okay, over to you, Chris, to press play for Teresa's video. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to hear what I have to say about distance learning today and why I feel it's it has an important role to play in education. My name is Teresa Tyler, and I'm the director of the Dog Genius Institute. It's a small business that was set up almost two years ago to provide online courses and qualifications to those working primarily in the dog training and behavior industry. I should probably start by sharing a little of my own learning journey. Eight years ago, I found myself living in Cyprus with my dogs and working long hours at the local veterinary clinic. Um, earning below minimum wage and working long hours. Prior to this, I had lived in the UK and worked as a veterinary nurse and uh, latterly as a psychotherapist. And psychotherapy and counselling as a profession was fairly non-existent in Cyprus. And of course, the need for a wage drove me back into the veterinary sector. Having worked in this role for some time, I decided I wanted to retrain as a canine behaviourist. So my learning began with an online diploma course in canine behaviour with a company based in the UK. It was pretty easy and only took me a few months to complete. So I decided to look for another course at um, more like a degree level course that I could do online. And uh, at that time, there were very few options available to me that didn't require at least some attendance in person. But this wasn't an option for me because I lived alone and I was abroad and I had nobody to care for my dogs. And being on a, a low wage, I could barely afford to enroll, let alone pay for travel and accommodation. Eventually, I did find a graduate diploma course in animal behavior management. And it was at this time that I discovered that my original diploma was not accredited or validated by an awarding body, which was hugely disappointing. I had paid almost a thousand pounds, yet it was essentially just an expensive book. The graduate diploma was an accredited and regulated qualification though, and it was completely online, so I signed up. By now I was back in the swing of studying and I began to dream about this thing called a PhD. The graduate diploma had really piqued my interest in the subject and I wanted to learn more. 
And so once again, I started the search for an online master's course. But once again, was disappointed to find so many, uh, so few, sorry, available. Um, but eventually, I came across the um, the MA in Anthropology at Exeter. Although not specifically about dogs or specifically about behaviour, it did offer something rather unique, and the focus on human and non-human animal interactions really appealed to me with my background in um, the veterinary profession and also in human psychology. So it was an opportunity to use those um, experiences and those backgrounds that I had, um, and it was like the perfect marriage of subjects for me, and it was also completely online. The delivery was really eye-opening, not just text to download, but they had uh, live tutorials, they were engaging lectures, and a really good blend of teaching methods. So I completed the, the Masters in a year, and six months later was accepted as a PhD candidate on what at the time I believe was the only PhD offered via distance learning, and certainly the only one in anthropology. Finally, seven years after I set out, I achieved my doctorate. None of it would have been possible had it not been for a few organisations having the courage to go against the mainstream and offer distance learning courses. For me, it was truly life-changing and inspired me to think about how I might do the same. Not only did I want to offer courses and qualifications that were accessible to all, but after my PhD research, which involved the study of hunting dogs in Cyprus, I really wanted to make a difference to how dogs are treated and perceived. I found um, a local dog training colleague um, would I found out that he would be interested in co-hosting some workshops and training events. So we started to host these uh, these days all over the island, teaching early career dog trainers and also um, interested dog guardians about dogs. I wanted to convey a more ethical approach to living and working with dogs and encourage people to see things from the dog's perspective rather than the human. And for them to really understand why dogs behave as they do, um, so the courses started to challenge myths around naughty behaviour and really started to open people's eyes to the idea that dogs could be persons in their own right, rather than being um, just things that we humans can dominate or control. These sessions were very popular and it was from these workshops that the idea of um, running courses and course development began. So with that in mind, I decided to think about the vision uh, for a company that would offer courses via distance learning. This was primarily because I wanted to get the message of how humans could be with dogs differently to as many people as possible, and in-person education just couldn't achieve that goal. I was passionate about the subject and determined to create courses that were different to the rest, and really promoted more ethical and dog-centric material. I also remembered the disappoint of, disappointment of discovering that my very first course that I completed was not validated through accreditation and was also not taught by someone who had teaching experience or qualifications. So this made me keen to ensure that what I offered to people was a genuine product and that it was off-qual regulated and had credits that, be, that could be used should learners wish to progress with their studies to higher levels. I wanted to ensure my trainers and tutors shared similar ethical values and were not only qualified in the subject that they were teaching, but also were qualified to teach in the first place. And most of all, I wanted those learners who enrolled to be afforded flexibility and to fit their studies alongside their working and personal lives, providing them with opportunities to make changes to the lives of the animals they work with, which for many would not be possible through a bricks and mortar route. So thinking about the, the ethical um, component of the business, uh, as you probably are aware, business ethics is a field in its own right. So what does that mean to a small business like mine? And can, business that, can businesses that are trying to make a profit actually be ethical? Well, yes, I think we are obliged to try to be, at least. I'm not um, an ethical or a management academic, but I do care about the ethical treatment of animals, and that includes humans. 
Therefore, as a business owner, I have tried to convey that approach in all we do. This means that courses are considerate of animal ethics, that tutors and other staff are supported as best they can be, that students are given ample opportunity to be developed, supported and protected through their learning experience. There are, of course, legal requirements that demand a type of ethical approach, and there are certainly regulatory ones set by Ofqual and awarding bodies. And more expansively, we have a social responsibility to be ethical. Business people are often accused of only considering the bottom line, and of course, this is in part true, else we wouldn't be in business. Yet I believe that being, a, being firm in our ethical responsibilities does get noticed and indeed attracts the right kind of customer because of it. So here's uh, just a few of some of the off accredited qualifications that we offer. And you can see that they are predominantly canine courses, but we are uh, pushing for off call approval of our cats and um, some equine courses as well. Our courses were accredited with a regulatory organisation called UK Rural Skills from the start. This offered some assurance that courses met certain standards. However, after a year of operating, I decided I wanted to go for off call regulated status on the main industry related courses. Ofqual was set up in April 2010 under the Apprenticeships, Skills, Children and Learning Act of 2009 and is also covered by the Education Act of 2011. Ofqual are responsible for endpoint assessment organisations who formally assess students at the end of an apprenticeship. They are a non-ministerial government department with jurisdiction in England and they are responsible for making sure that regulated qualifications reliably indicate the knowledge, skills and understanding students have demonstrated. Assessments and exams show what a student has achieved and that they require, they've met the required standard of the qualification and this gives people confidence in the qualifications that they regulate. Awards and organisations that have gained recognition by this regulator have shown that their qualifications are of a very high standard and are valid and fit for purpose. Every regulated qualification is designed, developed and awarded in conjunction with the off qual general conditions of recognition. This process has many strands, such as carrying out market research to identify and substantiate the need for a qualification in the first place, gathering support and feedback through focus groups and other channels from key stakeholders, working with subject and industry experts to write and ensure the content of the qualification is at the correct level, size, and meets required standards. Working with the industry subject and assessment experts to write and ensure the assessments are valid and fit for purpose as well as deliverable. Managing the verification, marking and awarding process to ensure the results are fair, reliable and valid. And there's also an ongoing life cycle management of the qualification to provide assurance it remains current, valid and fit for purpose. We, like other organisations, also offer unregulated courses which deliver excellent training. They are bite-sized uh, pieces of learning and CPD, which absolutely have a place in the market, but they may not be recognised outside the small business sector or be transferable like regulated qualifications are. In offering fully regulated qualifications, the student gets something more than just a piece of paper. They have something they can proudly display something that offers them a real return on their investment in time and money. So what are the challenges and benefits of online learning then? Well, we have found with online learning, staff and students enjoyed enhanced convenience, access and flexibility to the courses. As these courses can be taken and delivered from anywhere and any time, trainers and learners do not need to travel to specific locations. Many of my students are self-employed and work from home, and to not have to travel is really helpful. Online education creates an engaging and interactive environment for all participants in the classrooms, and it's more beneficial for students that are not comfortable with raising hands or speaking in a group environment. Many tutors have reported that students tend to, be, tend to have more meaningful discussions on important course topics at the end of an online course. Those who are not able to speak up due to shyness are also able to highlight their doubts in writing. When run well, online courses also tend to increase student retention and satisfaction rates, and this is something that we monitor continually. 
They can pursue their interests from home or while doing a regular job as well. Online learning opens doors for several opportunities where students can boost their skills in multiple directions with ease. There are also several incentives available for teachers as well. They can use new age technologies such as casting to make lectures more interactive for students. Online learning can also be supported by multimedia content, virtual reality and augmented reality. Online learning also extends reach to an extensive range of audiences. These courses are not limited to students that can reach a college or a university campus. Instead, they are equally beneficial to students all over the world. So some of the challenges that we have experienced is or are that uh, for tutors or trainers that have been following traditional means of, of teaching for the past several years, it can be a bit of a challenge and uh, it takes time to become familiar with some of the more complicated aspects of online learning practices. On one side, where campus-oriented courses are limited to a specific time duration and specific days in the week, online teaching opens doors for keeping courses open 24-7. So it can be challenging for teachers to understand the learning abilities of individual students during online classes. As teachers and students hardly get to know each other, it um, slightly less uh, familiar, if you like, with an online tutor. Um, it's also quite difficult to set up interactive environment in classes, although this can be done. Students that are new to online technologies may find them confusing, but to be honest, all our students have um, adapted really quickly and really easily to our learning platform. But where there are the occasional issue, teachers um, sometimes need to make additional efforts to communicate deadlines or to help students complete their assignments. Although online learning doesn't require advanced technical skills, um, those that are involved do need to be comfortable with using, using a computer and um, accessing the internet. So in some rural areas, slow internet connections um, can be frustrating. There is no doubt that every technology and advancement comes with some pros and cons and has challenges in implementation as well. But as we are all aware, the recent coronavirus pandemic affected the normal function of the world at a considerable level. And for almost a year, office employees were advised to work from home while following typical social distancing measures. This scenario was, more, was just as critical for students as they were not able to get back into a classroom environment to continue their learning. So in this situation, online learning has offered a great opportunity um, for both formal and informal interactions between students and teachers. Even after the rising trends of internet-based classes, it is important that we analyse whether online learning can replace classroom education or not. Um, few experts have recently conducted surveys and research to judge the potential of online learning. And although there are so many students who find it good to boost their knowledge through online courses, as it gives them more flexibility, some um, research has revealed that many students are likely to struggle more with online settings. So my top tips really are to um, provide learners with good quality technology that's user friendly. If they cannot use the learning platform, you know, you're failing from the start really. Um, I also like to provide them some in-person interactions through the use of peer groups or tutorials. This really helps with engagement and prevents feelings of isolation. We also have a really popular um, student Facebook group, which is always busy and um, there's loads of interactions and conversations going on in that group. We've created a content library with accessible materials that are easily shared as I find that this is really important to support learning. Um, we offer some IT support where necessary. And we try to keep learners engaged with live seminars, recorded lectures and videos because nobody just wants to sit and read text all the time. Often learners like to watch or listen to lectures and webinars <coughs> excuse me, because this helps maintain engagement and learning. We also tailor our training to individuals as much as possible. We update courses regularly to meet individual needs. So if something is difficult to understand, we change it. Or if somebody needs larger text or subtitles, we, we can attend to that too. 
We constantly evaluate our outcomes and we listen to our student feedback. Um, each learner is asked to provide feedback during and at the end of each course to inform our development. This is uh, what some of our learners have to say about our courses. And for uh, Robin here, accessibility and flexibility was really important for her. She says, I have recently changed from a structured course to distance learning as working as a veterinary nurse means I often work erratic shifts and long hours. Structured lessons didn't suit this and being able to dip in and out of the course content and do my work from home in my free time has taken off so much pressure and allowed me to still work full time. Um, Rebecca here was unable to travel to a venue, so our courses allowed her to access learning. And she says, as a mature student, having the option to do a distance learning course has enabled me to further both my knowledge and my career. I've been able to continue working and been able to study at a pace that suited my lifestyle. Having a disability that prevents me from driving had previously hindered my learning. Online options have empowered me to do the job that I really wanted. I am now respected and successful in my field due to distance learning. So flexibility and shyness impacted Angela's choices and she found distance learning suited her for various reasons. She says, I love distance learning for a number of reasons. I can study around my work and my life. I'm dyslexic so can go over the course material as many times as I need to or even walk away if I'm struggling and then come back to it. I also find that distance learning is good because you can message your tutor if you need anything, even if it seems a silly question, and they get back to you rather than in a classroom where there are lots of learners and you may not get a chance to ask or even may feel silly asking. Uh, so I'd like to end with um, just a, a few final thoughts. Um, I guess I'm biased when it comes to distance learning. As I said in the beginning, my own recent learning was purely distance based and I couldn't have achieved what I have without it. Uh, providing distance learning opportunities to others now not only meets my own desire to spread the ethical message I want to, but I see that it gives many others the opportunities that were afforded to me to gain knowledge and qualifications when they might not be able to do so in a more traditional way. Okay, so it isn't without its challenges. Um, I still feel it's considered less favourably by some. Um, I still think that universities in a more traditional sense are um, seem to be better for some reason. Um, but I do believe it is the future of education, especially vocational training, and it can only get bigger and better in time. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope you found it interesting. Um, here are my contact details. If you want to contact me afterwards, please do so. My email is teresa at thedoggenius.com. We have a Facebook page, just The Dog Genius, and Instagram, again, The Dog Genius. Or you can check out our website, which is www.thedoggenius.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Teresa. That was amazing. It's really interesting. I mean, I've got so many questions that uh, I could. I think we could almost do another um, another uh, whole hour on how you actually put the courses together, etc. Before I ask any questions, though, has anybody else got any uh, questions? Okay. So, hello and welcome back. Now over to Emma McLean. Emma is the founder and owner of Ham Charming, a horse-free training and behaviour consultancy company with a focus on dogs. Emma also trains horses and cats with humane science-based methods. Uh, she holds a diploma in canine behaviour with distinction from the International School for Canine Philosophy, sorry, Psychology. Um, Hound Charming was founded around four years ago and offers exclusively online services worldwide to her clients. And full disclosure here, I met Emma through our mutual voluntary labour of love, street living, animal rescue, rehabilitation and rehoming. OK, without further ado, Chris, do you want to press the play button? Thank you. 
Thank you for the introduction, Sarah. As she said, I'm Emma McLean. I'm the founder of Hound Charming. And today I'm here to talk to you about the Hound Charming Mentorship Programme. That's a model that we've been operating for about four years, but we've kind of formalised it into a package that people can come to us, enrol in and purchase um, in the last kind of 12 months or so. So I'm going to talk to you about how we've done that and how we've developed this system that's working really well. So the topics that we're going to cover today, firstly, who and what is Hound Charming? We're essentially a commercial business with a focus on dog training, but there is a bit more to it than that. So we'll talk about what those elements are in a little while. Um, what the Hound Charming Mentorship Programme is, how and why it got started, and the ways in which that Hound Charming has delivered online services and distance-based teaching to people and animals worldwide. The ways in which we strive to grow, to reach more people, to attract them, to draw them in so they want to work with us, and why we feel that remote coaching is necessary for people and animals. And then lastly, we'll finish up with the vision for the mentorship programme going forward. So who are we? As I've already said, I'm Emma, I'm the founder and owner of Hound Charming and this lovely lady next to me with this rather handsome horse called Archie is my mentor Maxine Easy and she is the founder and owner of Horse Charming. And as well as us, there's an amazing global team of people, people who have been through our programme, liked us and wanted to stay and we wanted them to stay and um, they're just a really diverse talented group of people, one of which is with us today, Robba, who's in control of the media for me. Um, she joined us a couple of years ago with her Corgi Lecter, and we're going to see a little bit of them later on. So what is the format of the programme? So we're offering a 13 week rolling course that you can join anytime. Uh, it's all delivered remotely and um, we have recorded tutorials or video lectures each week to watch and supplementary notes and that's Maxine delivering those lectures with a little bit of help from me uh, on the videos and then I do the one-to-ones live with people each week and in those one-to-ones we talk about any issues arising from the course, any issues they might have with their own animals or if they're training other people's animals already I'm helping them with their caseload. Uh, as well as the one-to-ones, we also offer video shadowing. So that's where I've met with my own clients on Zoom and recorded a session, either a live session or a um, behaviour consult. And then they're, they're then watching them afterwards so that they can gain information about, you know, different behaviour problems that they might be asked to tackle in the future with their own clients or with their own dogs. Um, and there's a rigorous testing process that goes through this course. We want our graduates to be amazing. So we do test them quite heavily at each module. OK, so in a moment, we're going to hear from the lady herself straight from the horse's mouth why we chose this format. We set up the mentoring program really because Emma had experienced what she's now offering as a mentorship to other people um, in the form of some formal education and coaching in behaviour change science. So the, the science of how animals learn, um, some one-to-one -one coaching and mentoring with her animals, with me and other people in our organisation. and. Both of us felt that this was something it would be really good to offer to other people who want to get more involved in the understanding, both the theory and the practical side of, of animal training in a bit more depth than you might get if you were just following a procedure to achieve some training objective with your animal. So, as she said, she showed me a model that worked for me and worked for my animals and that I was happy in and that felt right. And I wanted to share that model with other people. So that's why we've kind of formalised it into this offer that we that we now provide. 
Okay, so with any commercial business, it's really important how you gain more clients and how you reach more people. So we're going to talk about the ways in which we do that. Um, Facebook is an amazing tool for reaching more people, and we do that via groups largely. Um, one important one is the Do No Harm Dog Training Group. I've been an expert moderator there for around four years and um, in return for my services and my moderation within the group I'm allowed to advertise my services and the mentorship program is one of the things that I advertise and that's a really um, good market within that group because they're all either pet enthusiasts or wannabe dog trainers or current dog trainers so it's a really kind of focused um, advertising stream. Um, we also have our own online communities, um, two of those, Hound Charmers and Hound Charming. Hound Charmers is a small select group of clients past and present who have really embraced what we've got to offer and mesh well with us and wanted to stick around. And we kind of use that group as a way to foster good feelings really about one another, about our animals. We can come and say, we've had a bad day, we've had a good day, or here's a cute video of my dog doing something. And it just kind of is a really nice safe space. Often the world of Facebook and, and particularly dog training groups can be a bit hostile. And we've kept this really, really positive and really, really, um, homely I suppose and uh, yeah it's just one of my favourite online places to be. Uh, we've got the public page as well which is where we get reviews left for us and um, we share material um, and that's where we take all our inquiries into our inbox. Um, so reviews, recommendations and sharing videos you know sharing videos is a is a really really powerful tool um, in a minute we're going to have a look at Robert and Lecter doing some consent training I always know when Robert has shared one of her training videos in certain um, Egyptian Facebook groups because I'll all of a sudden get like five inquiries hit in my inbox like I want to train with you I want to train with you so it's a really powerful way to reach more people so in this video, we're going to see Robert and Lecter doing what we call consent training, which is a protocol that Maxine developed to help animals who are fearful around certain handling or husbandry things kind of express their preferences and feel safer and empowered. So let's have a look at that. Ready? Eyes. Yes. Ready? Eyes. Yes, good boy. He is a good boy, such a good boy. Um, so yeah, that's a, a really lovely little clip there and he's come so far and you know, we, Robert and I have never met in person, we don't need to meet, I've never put hands on Lecter, he's never sniffed me and yet we can transform his attitude towards something by working together. It's just an amazing thing. Uh, next on the list, we've got memes and education. So at the top there, you'll see in that kind of sepia picture with the Rottweiler wearing a prong collar that was one of our more popular memes and controversial you know we got a lot of good and bad responses to that on Facebook and I'm okay with that because I don't mind ruffling a few feathers at the end of the day traction on the post engagement on the post whether it's positive or whether it's negative sends it to so many more feeds so you know I'm comfortable with being controversial when it comes to animal advocacy um, word of mouth somebody comes to us they train their dog with us they get good results their friend gets a dog they say hey you sound charming and and so it goes on uh, vets and other agencies you know sometimes that happens that a vet will assess that an animal is in good health but they're still behaving either abnormally or strangely and they may say go and find a behaviorist and and that's how we kind of um, get some of our referrals um, and lastly, leaf, leaf animals and rescues. Leaf animals is an amazing online adoption platform, which was set up by two now very good friends of ours. And um, 
what they do is they match animals with the doctors and um, they are real big supporters of pound charming and of course free training and we are big supporters of them and they give us a lot of referrals which we're very very grateful for and just to finish off this slide rescues we've got some really good links in rescues um what i haven't yet said is that although we're a commercial business we use a percentage of our earnings to feed into rescue projects um, and we have a particular focus on disabled animals from the Middle East. So why use remote coaching? What are the advantages? I'm going to run through those with you now and then at the end of this slide we're going to have a look at some real life remote coaching and that was a live Zoom session between myself, Vigo and Yasso. So advantage number one, it's about time. Um, you don't have to carve out huge chunks of time to make vast improvements with your animal when you're doing it remotely. OK, so if you um, have got a trainer booked to come out at 9 a.m. on a Wednesday morning um, and you've got a headache and your dog's got an upset stomach, that session isn't going to go particularly well. Um, whereas this, you can pick and choose. You can train in short sessions and you can pick and choose the times when you and your animal are both relaxed. And we really encourage people to train um, while the kettle boils, I call it. So that literally means in two minute sessions while you're waiting for your cup of tea. I used to keep my dog's nail trimmers right next to my kettle to remind me to do a bit of nail trimming while my kettle was boiling and that way I've done my dog training you know he's got his nails trimmed I've got my cup of tea and I haven't had to find time that I just don't have you know we're all busy and we understand that um so I kind of amalgamated two points there. So we're now moving on to lessons performance anxiety. Once you're used to filming yourself with, with your animal, um, it's not so pressurized as having somebody come to your home and you then having to kind of do stuff in front of them. And, you know, from the dog's perspective, they haven't had to get used to a new person in their environment either. Um, it's climate friendly. We haven't had to put the diesel in the car to come see you. So that's another advantage and obviously no cost involved in travel. So all the coaching time is dedicated to coaching and therefore we can deliver the coaching a lot cheaper than a lot of our face-to-face um, -face, you know, um, colleagues. Uh, so our services were not affected by COVID-19 restrictions whatsoever. This model has been running for four years, so we predate COVID. And essentially, from a hound charming perspective, there was no change to our business model as a result of the restrictions. Um, over time, because we're about training you to train your animal, over time, um, people become less dependent on us and that's empowering they know how to do the stuff for themselves they don't have to keep paying us um, they choose to stay in our communities but a lot of people are now training their animal independently and Robber is a really good example of that again sorry to pick on you again Robber, but you know I taught her some stuff and now she'll kind of go I know how to fix this I'm going to have a go at it and then we might talk about it when she's already kind of beautifully executing it which is just lovely to see um, so training in short sessions gives you time for consolidation and practice you know you haven't had that mental onslaught of trying to learn something for like an hour at a time it's like you can have a bit of a think about it go away try again in 10-15 minutes or a few days later and actually we find that the retention of information both for humans and animals is much better like that um, so yeah this is a really really important one for me and something that i feel really strongly about because we're offering services that do not exist in the countries that we're offering it to on the ground so if you live in riyadh you cannot go and find a face-to-face -face dog trainer who is going to use humane science-based methods on your dog you can find a punitive trainer um, and there's a sliding scale, you know, that could be anything from somebody who uses a slip lead 
right through to electric shock. Um, and if you, you're living in these places and you don't want to treat your animal that way, your only viable option is to search online. And that's where we come in. Uh, so small overheads, you know, we work from home, we can fit it around busy lives. I've got children, lots of my clients are very busy people, but it works well because like I said, at the start of this slide, you don't have to carve out big chunks of time. You know, it's not an inconvenience that you just fit it in where you can. And, you know, from a, a business owner perspective, you know, I've done so much of my work with babies in slings or in buggies you know and people kind of joke with me that they often kind of see a little hand pop up when I'm talking to somebody um you know just when we're kind of informally catching up not necessarily during a live training session I do have childcare for those but you know it just works it fits in really nicely with busy lives and that works for us and for the client um, because it's pre-recorded, you can study all this material at your complete convenience. You know, um, many people um, in the Middle East are kind of getting up later. They might be studying at 11 p.m. They might message me a question. I'll see it at 5 a.m. I'll answer it. They'll get it when they get up. And, you know, it doesn't work never stops in terms of hound charming. It's a 24 hour operation and that's just great. And it works, you know across all time zones. Um, and as I said, yeah, I've already kind of covered that point really that all the training, um, all the coaching time is dedicated to coaching because we don't have to get in a car and come to you. Oh, we're just gonna look at the video there. I don't wanna forget this. So let's have a look at this little cute little video of us training Yasso to accept an oral syringe. Good boy. What a clever lad. Superman. Look at that. Good boy, Yeso. He's a good boy. So what you got in there then at the moment in the syringe? Uh, cream, white cream cheese. Yeah. And Arabic is called Labna. Brilliant. Yeah. Look at Take that. <laughs> So you can see how we're going to be able to progress that to taking stuff that's a little bit more neutral, a bit less competitive and a bit more neutral, but then you can reward him with the appetitive stuff. So with the cream cheese or whatever it is that he likes. So he takes a bit of water, he gets the cream cheese, he takes a bit more water, he gets the cream cheese. So you're still using that as a powerful yeah. reinforcer, but the syringe starts to get less, Repetitive, I suppose, because in the end, we want them to take something that could actually taste unpleasant and then get yeah. the reward afterwards. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the kind of the focus of that session really was to um, help. They're already doing really well, like via video, but basically, her agenda for Yasso was that she'd he'd got some sort of infection and she'd had to force oral medication into him and it was a real struggle it was an emergency she was there was nothing she could have done so after that had passed she kind of said I really want to train him to accept an oral syringe so we don't have to go through that stress ever again so that was kind of the um the point of what we were doing there but again you know no hands-on needed all been done remotely and working like a dream Okay, so our vision for the future. Uh, yeah, paying it forward. That's a big one for me. Um, I'm somebody who in my life has had, you know, quite big challenges to kind of overcome and process. I've done a lot of harm to people. I've done a lot of harm to animals. And I want to pay it forward. I want to give to people what Maxine gave to me, which I feel is a new pair of glasses. It's it's a way of living. It's not about animal training. It's a way of living in a kind of humane, compassionate way with thought and regard for the feelings of all living beings. And I know that's pretty deep and kind of, you know, out there stuff, but really it is, it's like once you get this stuff, it is a real epiphany. And, you know, I know that a lot of people kind of join us, you know, they make jokes about it being like it, like in a cult. And yeah, it is a bit like being in a cult, but it's a really good cult to be in. Um, so uh, improving the lives of animals and their caregivers one at a time, you know, that's 
really important for me to kind of stay sane and focused because if I start to think about the big picture stuff like all the animals suffering in the world all the animals on the streets with limbs hanging off all the overcrowded shelters you could just feel too overwhelmed and too sad to kind of do anything about it but my focus is the next animal the next caregiver and that way we can get really tangible results and make a difference um so yeah that's that's kind of what we're about and we don't limit our attitude about animals to companion animals uh, dogs cats horses we want humane treatment and the recognition of all animals as sentient beings um, and that they all deserve the same care and compassion as our companion animals do. Um, from wow to how, so what I mean by that is like we said earlier with the videos, you know, we put out good examples, we want people to see those and go, wow, that's amazing, how can I do that? And we'll go, well, we can show you. Um, building communities of like-minded people, you know, the, the Hound Thomas group is, is kind of what that's all about. And we want to obviously add more people to that over time. Um, and the rescue through the commercial side of the business is something that is really, really important to me. It was really funny actually recently um, on my Facebook memories, it came up and told me that six years ago, I posted a status, which was, I wish I could do more to help the animals boom, we did it, you know, and I, I didn't even remember creating that status, but, you know, it was obviously in me that I had to do something, and this kind of was what came out of it, which is just, like, mind-blowing, and the, the focus on rescue and funneling that money in, like, I get such a buzz out of, you know, it's great when I get paid by a client, but I get a bigger buzz by going, right, 50% is going to this rescue, or 30% is going to this dog who needs an operation, like, I get a real kick out of that, and it makes me feel like I'm doing something that matters, you know? So, um, we're going to have a look in a sec at a video testimonial, but before that, I'm just going to read to you um, what Maxine said her vision for the future is with regards to the Hound Charming Mentorship Program. So what she said is, we worked together to create this innovative program, enabling dog carers anywhere in the world to access science-based learning, personalised mentoring in a way that revolutionises the delivery of education and training through the use of simple technology that they use every day. And now we're gonna have a look at Vigo talking about how her partner Karim has had a complete 180 on this whole kind of training uh, approach. In the beginning, he was very much dogs need to be shown who's boss, dogs need to be told no. And he's been working with us, or Vigo has been working with us for six months and he's seen how much the dog has changed and improved. And this is what they've got to say about it. Yes, no, I think we're planning on taking up, uh, even my boy, my uh, Karim is like, no, I think we need to continue with this, with you. Wow. We really want to upgrade the package, maybe even to like a year or six months or like, we, we're not, we haven't had enough. <laughs> wow. We tried a lot of stuff hand in hand, honestly. We really did, did all our options because he was very difficult. And we learned how to tell him no. We learned all these like negative reinforcement stuff. And we realized we as a couple became very vicious towards the dog because there's no mm -hmm. cute way to say no. Mm -hmm. And we started becoming horrible and he started becoming angrier. And I could not believe my ears. Karim was like, I want to proceed with Emma's <laughs> trainings. I don't want this training. And you remember, I used to have problems with, problems with him in the beginning that he wasn't paying attention to the training, not doing it right. And, and now he's like, he only learned through Emma's training. I was like, okay. Wow. <laughs> that is crazy indeed. That's very reinforcing yeah. for Emma right now. Yeah, I mean, it is. I remember our discussion at the start when it was like you were struggling with him getting on board with it and stuff. So that's amazing. I'm so pleased yeah. to hear that. And tell yeah. him thank you, thank you from me for getting on board with it as well. I, I'll tell him for sure. Awesome. <laughs> right. Yeah, so love. Bye. Bye. Bye, Yasser, you handsome lad. See you soon, my <laughs> friends. Take care. Thanks Bye. so much. Cheers, Bye. mate. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 
so yeah that was a really cute little moment for me totally unexpected and unscripted but um really really nice to see and you know that's just one example of someone who's had a change in their way of thinking you know uh, five six years ago I was that person having that change in their way of thinking so when someone else gets there it just makes me so happy okay so this is a kind of closing comment from me really and in the background we've got one of the rescue dogs who um, the hound charming program uh, has benefited directly uh, her name is Werda and she's a disabled dog from Egypt who now lives with me but uh, prior to that um, the hound charming kind of client base we did some amazing fundraising to get her brought over um, and you know she's now really well looked after and I hope very happy so in summary hound charming and its mentorship program are a vehicle to bring about positive change in the lives of those that we come into contact with. We use our online services to do that and it works really well for those who are willing to work at it. I love that expression that it works if you work it. Um, you know, it's so true of so many things in life and, and it's absolutely true of the Hound Charming programme. You know, people are often put off, you know, to some degree or I need the trainer to be here with me I need to, you know I need the support of someone physically there and actually if you embrace this program as it's offered it works incredibly well and um, I hope you've enjoyed listening and learning about it and I look forward to your questions thanks very much oh thank you Emma really enjoyed that presentation and obviously I've, I've known you for some time and it's really nice to hear about uh, the background of, of, uh, of the whole business stroke rescue effort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for want of a better word. Um, has anybody got any questions for Emma?